Welcome everybody to uh, this webinar, uh, Climate Change in Big Sky Country, um, where uh, we will be talking about uh, the impacts of climate change on Montana's fish and wildlife. Um, I'm Alec Underwood, I'm the Federal Conservation Campaigns Director uh, for MWF. I also lead our advocacy work on climate change. Um, we've got an exciting uh, little panel discussion here today with two of our MWF board members. Uh, I'm joined by uh, Skip Kowalski, uh, retired uh, Forest Service biologist and a longtime MWF uh, board member for nearly a decade. Um, and Sarah Malloy um, is a regional water planner for Montana DNRC. She works with local communities to build watershed resilience in the face of changing water supply and increasing water demand. Um, Sarah is a first time board member for MWF and uh, as you'll hear today on our uh, little webinar, um, both Sarah and Skip were involved in the development of a 2020 climate resolution for the Montana Wildlife Federation, uh, which will inform our future advocacy work on climate change. So um, excited to jump in today and we will uh, uh, start uh, with Sarah. Um, Sarah, thanks for joining us and um, maybe give us a little bit of overview of what you're gonna uh, tell us today. Great, thank you, Alec. Um, happy to be participating in this panel. Um, I'm just gonna do, um, in the work that I do with local communities regarding water supply, um, I think it's helpful when we think about climate change to kind of look at Montana's water resources in, in a big picture sort of way um, and begin to understand how climate change is currently um, impacting Montana's water, um, which then of course has really significant implications for fish, wildlife and habitat and recreational opportunities among other um, things in Montana. So I'm just gonna do an overview of, um, of climate change super briefly um, and really how that impacts Montana watersheds. That sounds great. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Yeah, I'm just gonna share my screen here. All right, can you see the screen, the presentation? I believe so, yeah. All right, sounds good. So I just think it's, it's important to think about um, climate in Montana um, uh, sort of from a, um, just a, a foundational standpoint. And so climate, as we know, um, is really kind of long-term averages in weather that describe um, the, the long-term weather patterns in an area um, over typically several decades. Um, and climate is, is super variable. And as we know in Montana, um, you know, we're the fourth largest state in the nation. Climate um, varies widely from Western Montana to Eastern Montana. And a lot of that has to do with things like topography, mountains, um, humidity, wind, um, all sorts of things. So I just, I just wanna just make that sort of base note there. Um, and here's an example of some of that variability. Um, this is just a map of average annual precipitation in Montana and the, the sort of purplish colors in Western Montana are associated with um, more average inches of precipitation um, annually. And so you can see that, you know, Northwest Montana, as we know, gets a lot more precipitation than Eastern Montana. Um, and so that can have really big implications for Montana's water resources um, and fish and wildlife as we talk through this issue today. Um, and so when we think about climate change, I just wanted to point out, um, and this is from uh, the United Nations, I believe, but um, climate change is really this long-term change um, in meteorological and environmental conditions um, that can change the, the sort of variability of weather patterns and can be due to, or is due to natural and human causes. So it's important to think about um, natural patterns that are influencing climate and also human activities that are influencing climate and causing it to change. And so if we kind of hone in on Montana, we have this really excellent resource that I use a lot in my work um, called the Montana Climate Assessment. And if anyone's interested in looking that up, it's, it's this great uh, web page. Um, and this was really a joint effort by Montana scientists to um, look at observations in Montana's climate and also projections using climate models um, that are well accepted by scientists. 
And uh, so you can find that at montanaclimate.org. But what I kind of want to pull out here just to start with is these really key points about how Montana's climate is changing. Um, these are well known. I don't think this will be huge news to anybody, but really key to point out that temperature has increased over the last several decades, um, really over the last century since we've started recording um, temperature. Um, and the warming, according to climate models, is projected to continue. So they've projected out to mid-century and the end of the century. Um, and really significantly, we can see that projected warming is, you know, um, is up to 10 degrees by 2100, the year 2100. So that's a really big um, difference from how we experience um, Montana's temperature currently. Um, you can also see just briefly, frost-free days are increasing as are days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, summer precipitation is actually projected to decrease, um, whereas we might see in winter, spring and fall, um, a slight increase in precipitation. And this, this might sound super appealing, um, except that with warming temperatures, what we expect to see then is more, uh, more winter rain, warmer winters, and that can have really huge implications for our snowpack in Montana. So I just want to I just want to focus on just a few um, impacts to Montana's watersheds here, um, kind of taking what we what we uh, know about how climate change is impacting Montana's climate. So um, this is just this comes from the EPA, um, but this map you you likely have seen something like this before. Really, the way to read it is the larger the red dot, the more significant the snowpack decline. So if you look at Montana, like you know, many other locations across the West, um, we're really seeing that snowpack has declined. And this is actually observed snowpack um, since 1955. And unfortunately with warming temperatures, maybe more precipitation in the winter as rain, we're projected, um, or we, we will likely see declining snowpack into the future. Um, and this is super significant for Montana's snowpack dominated um, systems like much of Western Montana that relies on um, that mountain snowpack to really act as a big storage reservoir um, for water later in the season. Um, with that, we are seeing snow melt runoff happening up to a couple weeks earlier in many locations across the state. Um, and this also is projected to continue. And again, this is just kind of that, that typical um, uh, graph here showing that increase in average temperature in Montana that we were talking about. Um, and this is observed temperature across the record that we have here last century. Um, so with snow melt runoff happening earlier, it's important to think about the ways in which that's going to impact aquatic um, systems as well as terrestrial systems. Um, what's important to think about timing of precipitation as we saw in 2017, we had a really significant drought um, it wasn't, uh, you know, as bad in, in Western Montana, but in 2017, um, the whole state was in some sort of drought. Um, and what we really saw there was this total lack of spring precipitation upon which much of um, the Eastern part of the state relies on. So um, thinking about precipitation timing is really critical. Um, and as I mentioned, we, we may actually, models do predict um, a potential increase in winter and spring precipitation, but again, in our snowmelt dominated systems, this is gonna be um, really kind of a, more of a challenge than we think um, in terms of how we're going to store water for later in the season. Um, and then what we are already seeing and will continue to see is this decline in late summer water availability, um, which can really stress uh, aquatic systems quite a bit. Um, and often is when you know demand is highest from recreationists to outfitters and tourists and, and all of that, um, and agricultural irrigation. So uh, I think we're just going to continue to see um, lots of demand for uh, water in August, July, August, and September. Um, it's also important to think about drought being this natural feature of Montana's climate. Um, this, is, this is just a, um, really it's a relatively simple graph, but it's showing all of the green bars above zero um, are just showing periods of wetter years. Um, and this is the Palmer Hydrologic Drought Index, which kind of just, just shows the impact of drought on um, hydrologic systems in Montana. 
So you can see that again, the periods where there are green positive index values, these are wetter years. And you can kind of pull out these years that were drier, like you look in the decade of the 30s um, and you can kind of see the Dust Bowl in Montana, which was really significant in terms of environmental and economic impacts. You can also see a really dry period in 2000. So, and then the, the, the 80s were, were pretty significant in Montana as well in terms of drought. So I just like this visual because it really shows you that drought is a reality in Montana and it has been for a long time and, and will continue to be. However, with increasing temperatures, um, increasing atmospheric aridity, uh, changes in water availability and supply, um, there are projections that drought frequency and duration will, will very likely increase into the future. Um, and I wanted to just focus in on the Dust Bowl here. This is a, a similar drought index. Again, the blue is indicating years with more water availability and the red is drier years. Um, and there's this fascinating um, reconstruction of Montana's uh, uh, drought history that goes back a thousand years um, using tree ring data. And so I, I love this, this graph here because it shows um, that in the past Montana's climate um, wasn't just associated with decadal droughts, but multi-decades of of super dry conditions. So this is something that um, Montana very well could experience again in the future. So I think thinking about drought um, is really critical as we can see um, from Montana's drought history here. Um, and then lastly, I just wanna point out that, um, you know, Montana is a popular place um, for, for lots of folks and, um, you know, we are starting to see an increase in water demand, especially in our urban um, centers. And so there's a projection, of course, it's, it's not too hard to, to see the writing on the wall, but water demand will very likely increase um, as our population and water demand grows. So, um, all right, I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. And there we go. Um, well, that was great. I, I mean, I really think you you went through some of the some of the major impacts to our our, our streams and our rivers and in water availability, generally speaking. And you know, I think when we uh, when we consider what those impacts look like to our fish and wildlife, um, water just like to humans is everything, right? Um, when when we think about fisheries in general, you know fly fishing in this state makes up such a huge part of the outdoor recreation economy. You mentioned outfitters, guides, and the tourism aspect of bringing people from all over the world to fish some of the greatest uh, streams in the world, the most world-renowned trout fisheries, um, many of them being here in western Montana. Um, when we look at impacts to cold water species, you know, trout have a, a thermal tolerance level up to anywhere from 68 to 72 degrees, uh, depending on the species. Um, but when we look at really sensitive species like bull trout, um, which is an ESA listed species, um, you can't fish for them in most places in Montana. Um, and much of that due to, they've, they've seen rapid declines in their range. And what the biologists are um, determining is that, you know, one of the leading factors for that is this increase in water temperatures. And, um, you know, for bull trout particularly, but also cutthroat trout um, that have a, a thermal tolerance, you know, they start to feel stressed at about 68 degrees. And, um, you know, part of the problem being not only their, their range is shrinking where they can handle these, um, you know, increasing water temperature trends, but also non-native fish species that are moving in um, and sort of taking over in some cases. And so, you know, when we think about it from a native fish perspective or even just a cold water fisheries perspective, um, these are things that are going to impact uh, these fisheries that we all really care for quite deeply. Um, and then, of course, you know, water availability uh, is just as important on the terrestrial side as well. Um, and then when we think about how, uh, you know, this relates to our access to um, you know, FWP, has hood owl restrictions that they place on our rivers in which you can't fish 
uh, for the afternoon and into the evenings. Um, and those are put into place when we have our fish that are feeling uh, that thermal stress due to, to the water temperatures being too warm. Um, we've seen more and more of those every year. Uh, they're, they're happening earlier in the year. Um, 2017, Sarah, you mentioned as a, a pretty terrible drought year, I think record drought year um, in terms of duration. And uh, that year, um, I, I think that it was either that year or 2016, we had, you know, we had some restrictions being put in place in late June, <laughs> which is just wild to think that, um, you know, we weren't even into July yet and, and we had restrictions on our rivers because of how hot it was. And so um, this is something that I think uh, we're going to see more of and, and, you know, definitely related to the impacts of climate change with um, prolonged drought and more intense drought. Um, I guess that, that kind of spurs a question that I have for, uh, for you, Skip and Sarah. Um, you know, what, uh, what concerns you most about uh, climate change, either generally or as it relates to our, our fish and wildlife and recreational opportunities? Um, Skip, do you want to go first? Yeah, actually, the, the most frightening part about climate change, from my perspective, is the changes in habitat and how changes in habitat conditions, especially for terrestrial wildlife, you covered a lot. Alec, about the, the aquatics, but for terrestrial wildlife, we're going to have major changes in vegetation over the next number of decades. Uh, in fact, it's been reported that Missoula will probably have a climate very similar to Salt Lake, uh, the, the front range, uh, the Wasatch Front. So instead of having the winter ranges that we're, we're uh, familiar with here, we're going to have, you know, gamble oak and bitter brush. Uh, and that's going to be a, you know, a major consequence in terms of the animals that we have here, the big game species. The other aspect of that is, is how drastic things are changing uh, because of climate effects all currently happening. Uh, the increase in wildfires are causing fires to burn hotter and in larger uh, expanses so that instead of having the normal sequence of plant succession, we're sterilizing the soils and creating an environment where it's really hard for the plants to recover. So that, th those, are the, those are the major issues that I'm really concerned about. Uh, we're really not sure about how the impacts of, of, of uh, vegetation and habitat are gonna change with climate change, but we know the change is gonna be there and the animals are just gonna have to respond to it. Thanks Skip, I'm glad you mentioned um, fire. I think that's just such a big component of this issue too and a huge challenge and, and with that this year especially um, you know thinking about human health impacts from smoke is is really concerning just because there's no there's really no escaping that um, you know other than hiding out in your house with an air filter um, or purifier I think for me um, you know I, you know thinking so much about water as I do um, snowpack is is this invisible um, reservoir, that's the way we think of it um, in, in water resources fields. And, you know, we see big reservoirs like Canyon Ferry um, or Fort Peck. Um, and, you know, we think that that's sort of this great solution to um, our late season water availability issues. Um, when in fact, so, so much of our water storage just happens naturally either in snowpack or, um, or in aquifers underground naturally. And so I think to me, what concerns me the most is just this decline in this really critical um, storage reservoir that, that people don't spend a lot of time thinking about for which there really is no substitute. We're not going to be building giant reservoirs into the future um, in terms of public um, uh, sort of will or site suitability. That's just kind of a thing of the past. And so I, I really want people to understand the importance of snowpack, the importance of aquifer storage and functioning natural systems that can um, kind of make up for that, that really big um, change due to climate. Yeah, and I'd, I'd say similar to, to both of your answers there. Um, 
Yeah, I'm just concerned on uh, the effects that this is going to have on our fish and wildlife and how uh, how they're going to adapt or maybe not be able to adapt. Um, you know, as I said, species like bull trout, um, their range is shrinking very rapidly. Um, even in the last 10 years, some of the biologists um, for FWP have, uh, who are monitoring um, uh, like red counts uh, for, for bull trout in some of these streams, even close to Missoula here, Rattlesnake Creek, and uh, these fish are disappearing a lot faster um, uh, than we previously thought. And, uh, and so, I, you know, I guess some species will do better than others, but it still is a, a scary reality for those that, that can't adapt uh, to those changes. So I um, appreciate both of your answers. I guess that leads us to um, kind of what MWF is doing. And as I mentioned, or at least I hope I mentioned at the beginning of the uh, panel here, um, we will be showing our, our short film, The Last Cast, which focuses on some of the everyday people in Montana who depend on having um, our, our rivers and our streams uh, being functioning ecosystems and, and not impaired um, as it relates to the fisheries uh, from warming water temperatures and, uh, and their personal perspectives on that. And so stay tuned for that. But um, until then, um, Sarah and Skip, you both were uh, very involved in the development of a new uh, organizational resolution for MWF to guide our ongoing work on climate advocacy. Um, and that, you know, that involves a little bit of language on uh, both adaptation and mitigation. And um, uh, Skip, I'm wondering if you could kick us off to tell us a little bit about the importance of this resolution and kind of how it guides MWF's work uh, moving forward on, on climate change. Well, thanks, Alec. I think the, the, the big thing to remember is that uh, National Wildlife Federation has been working on the climate change issue for decades. And Montana Wildlife Federation has, has been reluctant to join in that effort, at least in the, in the recent past. And uh, that reluctance uh, has occurred primarily because we failed to recognize the, the distinction between mitigation and adaptation. And um, we were focusing on mitigation, essentially how to uh, reduce fossil fuel use and, uh, and then deal with the uh, subsequent consequences and values of, of improved conditions for fish and wildlife as a result of the reduction in those emissions. But we, we ran into some roadblocks related to some of our membership when it came to dealing with that because uh, many of our members are actually employed in the oil and gas industry. Many of our members hunt and fish on properties that, um, that are involved in oil and gas development. So once we cleared that distinction between mitigation, which was focusing on fossil fuel reduction to adaptation, in other words, uh, living with the consequences that climate change is going to be inevitable, how are we going to cope with it and how are the critters going to cope with it and how are we going to help the critters cope with it. And once we overcame that obstacle, then uh, drafting this resolution became uh, quite a bit easier because we can really relate to the animals and the conditions and the recreational resources that, that we enjoy. Uh, just to summarize very quickly, the resolution actually covers a number of areas that are relative, that are very important. One of them relates to uh, no net uh, increase in carbon emissions uh, from current levels by, by the year 2050. Another portion of it calls for uh, developing renewable energy resources and also incorporating best management practices to accommodate for fish and wildlife needs. A third element in the resolution calls for the states and federal agencies to develop strategies for dealing with it. And our own uh, Kathy Hadley has worked on uh, the Montana Climate Solutions Plan uh, here in the state of Montana. So we've already begun on making that, uh, that effort uh, a reality. The final uh, area of, of importance, I think, is the one of how 
this whole resolution will impact us and our membership. And I'd like to read the, the final uh, clause in this resolution. And it says, be it further resolved that the Montana Wildlife Federation will help educate, organize, and amplify the voices of hunters, anglers, and other organizations and citizens to advocate for the policies to help ensure immediate actions are taken to encourage climate adaptation and mitigation. So that's the call, that's the rallying call for our membership. If we want to have fish and wildlife resources like we're accustomed to and be able to recreate and enjoy them, not just hunting and fishing, but the non-consumptive uses as well, uh, we're gonna have to really get involved in this. We've, we've tarried for too long as an organization and this resolution hopefully uh, will pass at our upcoming board meeting and it will chart the course for, uh, for our organization in the future. These resolutions are actually the, the focal point and the, the marching orders for our staff to carry out the mission of the organization. So once we have these resolutions in place, that provides the guidance for, for our folks uh, to really carry out the mission of the Montana Wildlife Federation. And this is also a rallying call for all of our membership and our affiliates to join in. Thank, thank you, Skip, so much. That was a that was an awesome summary of the the resolution. And um, as a staff member, I will I will do my best uh, if you if you pass that resolution to uh, follow all of the guidelines we have in there. <laughs> um, and you kind of answered the question I was going to ask. Um, you know, why is it important? for hunters and anglers, um, you know, to be involved on this issue. And I think, you know, from my perspective, th there is no um, bigger long-term threat to the persistence of a lot of fish and wildlife species than, than climate change uh, when, we're, when we're projecting into the future here uh, about those impacts. So um, I wonder, uh, Sarah, do you, have, um, do you have thoughts on why you think it's important that not only our membership, but you know, hunters and anglers and anybody who cares about you know outdoor recreation in these special places uh, should be advocates on on co combating climate change. Yeah, I think you said it well, Alec. Um, I would also note that these are the people, you know, us included, who are out um, on the ground and experiencing these changes and seeing you know some of some of what's happening to fish and wildlife and habitat and even recreational opportunities. Um, I was working in the uh, upper Yellowstone um, what, in 2016 when the, the river was closed. There were 183 miles of the Yellowstone River closed to any form of um, recreation or use um, because of this novel you know, fish kill that happened um, that, that really caused um, a lot of problems for mountain whitefish that year. Um, and you know, I think that um, I think that one of the real strengths of of the community that you mentioned, Alec, um, outdoor enthusiasts and hunters and anglers, is that you know collectively, as we've seen with plenty of issues in the past, we have a really loud voice. Um, and I think that one of the the um, you know benefits of membership in MWF um, and also um, similar organizations is just. Uh, having that that voice heard and so i think that um yeah I, I i guess i just would say um there there's a lot of opportunity to get involved and as skip mentioned um especially related to adaptation there's there's a lot that we can do it, it's no longer this sort of hopeless future thing um but as we've seen and as people who are out on the ground see there's a lot happening in terms of impacts but there's there's a lot that we can do and uh, and so we should work together to help fish and wildlife. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that uh, MWF has, has been one of the only, at least Montana-based sporting organizations that has been involved um, in, in climate advocacy work within the, the sporting community for um, a little while now. And uh, I think we'll continue to do that. And, and I think you're right, Sarah, um, you know, it's not all uh, doom and gloom. Um, you know, what they're projecting is, is certainly negative impacts for a lot of fish and wildlife, but we, 
and our membership can certainly play a part in advocating for um, not only the policies that are going to help uh, mitigate climate change, but also uh, the, the, the different uh, projects and, and landscape level things that we can look at for adaptation uh, to these impacts. So, um, and, uh, you know, as I, as I mentioned, um, you know, we've got a showing of the last cast. I really want to thank both uh, you, Skip, and Sarah um, for joining today and lending your, your personal perspectives and also your professional expertise um, on the issue of climate change. And uh, yeah, I think MWF is in a great position to continue um, our strong advocacy work on this. So um, thank you so much for all the work that, that both of you do on the board and uh, in your profession. So thank you. And I think right now we are going to uh, go ahead and do the virtual showing of the last cast. So thanks all of you who joined and uh, that should be popping up here in just a second. It does look like we have a little bit of audio issues at the moment. So if you all bear with some it. of these trout streams that come out of the mountains in western Montana and climate change is a direct threat to some of those values. So working for Trout Unlimited, the thing that concerns me most about climate change are statistics like that by 2080, over 50 percent of cutthroat habitat in the west will disappear. And that's 50 percent of already greatly reduced trout habitat. On years where there's a lot of snowpack coming into the summer, you can more or less expect to have decent flows late summer. On years of low snowpack, you can expect to have low flows late summer unless there's unusual precipitation events. So when you have that issue coupled with an earlier runoff where the water comes off earlier, that is the concern that late summer will have lower flows in the future where water is warmer and lower for longer periods of time. Climate change appears to be affecting that dynamic. Not only do the fish lose, but people who are anglers lose, businesses that depend on that lose. And really there's a, there's a public health concern too, because the same water, clean cold water that keeps trout healthy, also provides humans with clean cold water. To think that next year is gonna be my 20th year of fly fishing is pretty crazy. And what concerns me most as an angler is that with climate change, I might not make it to my 50th year of fly fishing for cold water species. For elected officials, we don't have the time to deny the science any longer. If you care about these rivers and streams, if you care about the quality of life of your grandchildren, you've got to get on this issue and you've got to get on it yesterday. Sean Blaine. I'm based in Bozeman, Montana, and I've been guiding for 18 years. We all are seeming to fight amongst ourselves for the moral high ground when it's sort of like having a, a fist fight in the middle of a burning building. 
we need to come together as a whole. It doesn't matter what sort of technique you use to catch fish, you still have to have fish to catch. And if climate change continues, your little faction won't matter squat. In 2016, 180 miles of the Yellowstone River was closed to all river recreation. And Livingston, in essence, became a ghost town overnight. That summer, we had record high temperatures and record low flows on the Yellowstone River. That, right there, that's why it's important to act right now. Because if climate change continues as it is, Sites like that, you may not see them in the future. And that gets really right to the heart of it. That young man rowing that boat. Um, I know it seems improbable right now, but if climate change continues at the rate that it's at, when he's an adult, he may not be able to do that on this river. And that's, that's why it's important that we all act now. My name is Tony Reinhardt, Missoula, Montana. I've been guiding for 22 years. When I started guiding, August was one of our busiest months. Now it's definitely the slowest month of our season. Um, hotter summers have led to warmer water temperatures and a good chance of fishing restrictions in August. Through conservation and a bunch of other efforts, we have a world-class fishery out of Missoula right now but I'm not sure what that's going to look like 30 years from now. With changes to the climate and warmer water and bigger fires and all these concerns associated with climate change, I don't know that our, our resources are going to keep getting better like they have in the past. I'm Margo Nielsen, I'm 11 years old, and I live in Great Falls, Montana. Brian Nielsen, been guiding and outfitting for 25 years on the Missouri River in central Montana, making a living dependent on cold, clean water. My daughter turned 11 two days ago, and last year when she was 10, she caught her first fish on a fly rod. And the more I see her enjoy fly fishing, the more I have concern for climate change. And losing, losing these cold water fisheries will be devastating to my family, and to the industries in the state of Montana. I want to be able to enjoy these things for the rest of my life. And if climate change continues, I don't think I'll be able to do that. If she can't enjoy this with her kids and take me down the river when I'm a dawdling old fool, it's just not acceptable. We have to make a change. It's just not okay. Something has to be done right now. As an outfitter, our entire industry relies on healthy fisheries. Climate change is directly affecting the health of our rivers. As a young girl, I fished the Bitter River with my father, and I just loved to fly fish. And I was involved with a lot of guides back in the late 90s who were really talking me up to try to guide. And I just loved being on the river and showing people the experience of the Bitter It. And, you know, every day is an adventure, and it's just, it's a fun way to make a living in this valley. Jenny West, I was raised here in the Burritt Valley. I've been guiding for 17 years. The outdoor recreation industry for the state of Montana is huge. It's seven, over $7 billion. And my livelihood depends on cold, clean water. Growing up here, we used to see, you know, the river would just run off all of June and we wouldn't be able to fish after July 4th. And now we're seeing, you know, fast erratic runoffs in May and even end of April. We're seeing hatches of bugs change. We're seeing uh, drought-like conditions earlier in the season, like middle of July, end of July, and our rivers get closed down for hoot owl. It's hard to try to make your clients happy when, you know, the water temps are getting really warm. The river is the lifeblood of 
so many things more than just, you know, trout. It's about the love of the river and being outdoors and the whole picture as well. And it's just so important to, to take care of these amazing places because um, this is the last best place. The science is clear on what is happening out there. And to think that we are going to lose a, a huge percentage of suitable habitat for cold water species over the next few decades is scary. I think we're at a critical point for the world of fly fishing in the state of our fisheries. And it's a point where we need to come together to combat this issue. As anglers, we should be working every day that we can to give back to these resources that we love so much. And to think up until this point, the angling community as a whole and the industry has not taken collective action on the issue of climate change. It's embarrassing. You know, if you fish in Montana or anywhere in the West or any cold waters and you think that pinching a barb or practicing catch and release is enough, it no longer is. You need to step up and act on climate change. These waters depend on it. These fish depend on it. As they shimmer in the sun. At the end of the day, when you get off the water, can you look yourself in the mirror and say that you did what you could to protect what you love, to protect what you claim that you love? If not, then you're doing it all wrong. What are you going to do about it? Now the days are getting longer again, like they have in years before. All the heat is getting stronger, my friend. It's like the devil at my door. It's like the devil at my door. So let's take the heat down to the pond. Watch the fireflies prance in the dawn. Everything feels better after midnight. Summer wine. No regrets, shadows dance with their cigarettes. Everything feels better in the moonlight. Every day I keep on breathing deep into my short lung. Now the air is getting thick as thieves, stealing all of summer's fun. Stealing all of summer's fun. All of summer's fun. How long can this drought last? I've seen it come and go before. Sometimes it's only the rain keeping the devil off our doors. God knows it's all.